All right, well, let's get going. So you guys are all here, apparently, because you wanted to hear about this thing, EPUB. And since this is a PDF technical conference, um, I'm a little surprised. Now, some of you may have come with like rotten vegetables or other things like that. And I confess I'm a little worried because the last time I spoke at a PDF technical conference was in 2012 when our EPUB 3 was fresh and shiny and new and, and uh, I was a little fresher. Uh, but that, that was in Basel, Switzerland. Did anyone go to Basel? No, nobody here. Well, it was a really nice conference except that, except that I uh, tried to ski down a glacier and tore my ACL. Uh, the day before I spoke, so I had a, a knee that was about this big, and um, um, there was some joking about how, since I was kind of talking about this alternative format, uh, that maybe it was kind of inflicted by, uh, you know, like Tanya Harding's new boyfriend <laughs> or something. So, <laughs> if anyone after this talk, you know, really hates me and EPUB, and and just do the other knee, I beg you, because this one's not quite the same. So, um, okay, well let's uh, let's get rolling. And 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 how many of you are f would consider yourself familiar with EPUB? Okay, a few. Great. How many of you are primarily solution developers? You know, you, you build solutions around EPUB and other technology, I mean, uh, PDF and other technologies. And how many of you are primarily kind of PDF content publishers, or, you know, you work with PDF and make PDF? I mean, we all make PDF, but. Okay, it's a mix. Well, then since it's a mix, we'll, we'll try to do a bit, of, uh, a bit of everything. The tagline of this conference was uh, for those who work with documents. So I do feel that EPUB, you know, is included in that, uh, at least by extension. And, and I've been working with documents for the last uh, almost 30 years, so, um, so certainly it resonates with me. And I'm not exactly sure why, why Duff invited me here. Um, you know, partly it was maybe entertainment value. Part of it was perhaps because since I used to work at Adobe and had something to do with the creation of PDF and PostScript, I might be able to tell you a few of those corporate secrets, skeletons in the closet of the deep dark past, since it is almost Halloween, um, but we'll see about that. I, I'll do my best to reveal a few uh, as, you know, never, never before heard uh, secrets about the, the old days. Um, so just first, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, required requisite pitch for my association. Uh, I hope all of you are members of the PDF Technical Association. Uh, I represent the International Digital Publishing Forum, which is a trade and standards group representing the digital publishing industry. So we have over 350 members, we're a global organization with members in over 45 different countries. And our members are from all parts of the value chain. We have uh, solution technology companies like Adobe, Apple, uh, Google, IBM, and Intel, uh, major publishers like Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Hachette, Kodansha, uh, Pearson, and so on. Uh, and then specialty companies, folks who are specifically working on solutions for digital publishing, ebooks, digital documents, learning content, all coming together to develop uh, open standards. So we, we uh, you could call this, I guess, the EPUB Technical Association. I mean, in other words, we're similar perhaps to what, what uh, Duff and Company do for PDF for EPUB, but we do have a slightly bro broader remit in that we're also about kind of optimizing the supply chain for commercial digital publishing. So some uh, ancient history uh, for to kind of get us rolling on, on before I explain about, uh, about what EPUB is. Now, it's, it's traditional to start these kinds of historical looks at publishing to go to clay tablets or at least the Gutenberg uh, Bible. And I'm going to skip all that. I'm going to go straight to at least, uh, you know, what we did until we had PostScript, right? PostScript, for anybody who is, who's familiar with PostScript here? Everybody, awesome. Um, except for the few of you who don't have gray hair, right? Okay. <laughs> and or still have hair. Um, Sorry, ma'am. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, the uh, PostScript uh, revolutionized publishing in the 1980s and created this thing called desktop publishing. So that was cool. And uh, those of us who were at Adobe at that time and working on PostScript and working on things like Apple Laser and so on, um, we kind of revolutionized an industry and, and changed what was happening with, with creation of books, magazines, all kinds of content. But the final output was still exactly the same thing. The final output of these PostScript prepress workflows was still paper. But along the way, people started exchanging PostScript files without printing them. There was this new thing called the internet, and on it was this new thing called FTP, and pretty soon there was these FTP repositories of hundreds or thousands of PostScript files, which people started to exchange 
in lieu of mailing somebody a physical document. And we thought that was rather silly because PostScript was never designed to be a good format for representing a document in, a, in an electronic form in, in the sense that it, it didn't have, the pages were dependent on each other, you couldn't reorder the pages, uh, you couldn't go to page 37 in a document, and it was a dynamic language. PostScript is an interpreted language, and so you really had to execute this whole program, which as a side effect might spit out some pages. But that's not a very handy thing to do if you want to display a document on your computer. So John Warnock had this, this brainstorm that, well, we, we already have a non-interpreted non version of PostScript. It's called the Adobe Illustrator format. It's sort of a distilled down version of PostScript into these more declarative artwork primitives. But it's really the same thing. An Adobe Illustrator page and a, and a page that comes, out, that, that comes out of PostScript really have the same graphical model, the same Bezier graphics, you know, the same graphical stack and, and affine transforms and all that other good stuff. So why don't we just take a bunch of Illustrator files and glue them together, and we'll make a better document format for electronic use than PostScript. And that's kind of what he did for his first prototype. He, 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 you guys may not all know, but John Warnock personally wrote the first distiller, which was a PostScript program that ran in a PostScript printer and took in PostScript and, and spat back out this sort of sequence of Illustrator files that was kind of the primordial uh, PDF. Uh, but it had some issues. It didn't have random access between, uh, between objects, for example, which uh, was kind of a a problem, so we created this thing called cause and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the vision of, of, of uh, PDF you know, got started back then, and I'm sure all of you know that the code name of Acrobat was Carousel, and that that refers to not the thing that you go around in in a, in a, in a, in a kid's amusement park, but the slide projector that, that, that uh, most of us will never see again. Um, so that's what PDF was for, a sequence of final form pages that reliably replicated paper in a digital form that was a lot more useful than just a print stream, but had the property that you could create it from any print stream. And the original way to create it was, in fact, to create it from a postscript uh, that was created from a print driver. And only later did we generate, uh, create new, you know, direct PDF uh, makers, as they started being called. So life was good. Postscript grew and prospered. It created a whole industry. It created a billion dollars a year of revenue for Adobe eventually. It eclipsed Postscript. Uh, uh, which was a huge business. There was times where people went to John Warnock and said, what are you nuts? We're making all this money on PostScript. What's this crazy thing off in the corner? And, and Acrobat 1.0, which was sort of a MVP or minimum viable product uh, uh, prototype. The reason they don't have the disk of Acrobat 1.0, by the way, is no one, no, we didn't want to save that disk. Because yeah. we threw it away and started over with Acrobat 2. Um, and I'm told that there's still Acrobat 2 code living till this to this day which is scary because I even think some of it has my initials in it in, in comments and stuff. Usually with XXX near them, it means that there's something wrong. So, because uh, I was already kind of becoming a useless manager, but I, I uh, still wrote some code. So, so Acrobat 2, in fact, was the first version that, that created a code base that, that, that mattered. And part of that was because it was the first one that was a real platform. Acrobat 1 had no plug-in APIs. Again, it was a prototype that just got kind of shipped. Uh, Acrobat 2, we created APIs, we created a scripting environment and a way to add plugins to Acrobat and Reader. We also made the Reader free, which of course was a huge, huge deal that was uh, not, not done properly from a business model point of view in Acrobat version one. And PostScript, post PDF grew and prospered and Acrobat grew and prospered and we have this wonderful situation we're in today where there's a whole industry of content on PDF in enterprises, in governments, in research, and of course on the web, PDF is one of the most prevalent content types on the web. So we really can think of PDF as part of that. But the web really evolved in parallel. In fact, I still remember the first meeting where some people came into Adobe. I think we hadn't moved to this building yet. We we're still in Mountain View. And said, you know, there's this World Wide Web coming. It's going to be huge. And they kind of had these kind of, this was the first World Web logo. And I don't know if they had this logo still, but whoever came and talked to us, they had stars in their eyes and it seemed like they had, were wearing Birkenstocks and and uh, we thought, oh, well, that's nice, but you know, we got like millions of print documents we're trying to get digital here. Would you just get out of our way and uh, let us keep working on that? And we kind of poo-pooed the web uh, at the very beginning. But in fact, at the same time, it was, it was scaling up massively. It, it started this tiny thing, and it started exponentially scaling. PDF maybe scaled a little bit exponentially, but I would say, in, in a way, compared to the web, it was, it was more linear. And we, we almost couldn't understand it at Adobe because we could make PDFs with the press of a button. And this HTML thing, you had to hand code it. I mean, you had to like get in there and mark it up, and 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 it was you know it was almost a little um, confusing. Um, 
about about why PDF why why HTML um, went the way it did in terms of getting huge, and a guy named Roy Fielding solved it some some years later when he explained the fundamental architecture of the web, which is called REST. Uh, he now works in in this building, in fact, for Adobe uh, as a senior principal scientist, um, and he realized that the web's fundamental architecture of HTTP, where you get dynamic responses from requests is ideally suited to organic growth because you can add new websites that link to other websites in this very dynamic model without having to change any of the other clients or servers except those that are creating links. So it, the web is a hypermedia uh, model and it was the first hypermedia system that really showed scale partly because it built on, an, on this protocol called HTTP that has a small set of just four general general uh, verbs in its API that was very extensible thanks to the embedding of hypermedia links. Now, of course, you can embed links in PDFs, but the whole model of PDF was just not this dynamic thing. It wasn't designed to represent information that w where every page was changing all of a sudden. It was designed to represent a final form thing. Um, so it didn't scale quite as, as, as fast. And the way I think about the web, a, a website is like a, a house where the rooms have connections to other rooms, but you don't know what those connections are until you go into a room. There's no, you can't get a map in advance, because on a website, these rooms are <coughs> dynamically materialized. You knock on a door, which is like an HTTP request, you get back a, a representation, which might be totally different and customized for you or based on the phase of the moon from any representation that you gave to the last guy or gal that knocked on the door. And then when you go into another room, the same thing happens. So you're kind of going from, from dynamically generated room to dynamically generated room via dynamically generated corridors, links, or I guess tubes if you're, if you're Al Gore. Um, and, and that's the internet. And that dynamic architecture is a great strength of the web. It's unfortunately a strength that leads to a somewhat chaotic environment. Um, and so we really, we really had these different document standards. We had this XML-based, uh, SGML-based markup thing that ultimately led to HTML slash XHTML as its kind of apex or, 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 or where we've gotten to. And then we had this PostScript generating the PDF thing that was about final form pages, a page description language leading to a document description language. Um, and we, in my view, we kind of missed an opportunity early on by just taking Adobe Reader and making it a plug-in to Netscape. Adobe designed, in fact, uh, folks working for me, designed the NSAPI plugin uh, to Netscape and also de designed the HTTP byte serving protocol that allowed PDF to work moderate the efficiency on the web by being able to kind of grab bits of the file. All that stuff uh, enabled Reader to plug into the web, but we declined the offer to fully integrate. We had the chance to say, let's just put these things together and, and, and make it native. And uh, of course, that billion dollar business that was growing was probably a fine reason uh, in the interest of our stockholders not to do that. Um, but we did do one little bit of it. We took the, the image, the page description part of PDF, that thing that was inherited from SVG that was ultimately derived from the PostScript imaging model, and we made this thing called SVG. Richard Cohn, who wrote most of that putty book that Duff waved around before, mm -hmm. had that putty book open on his desk while he was typing in the, the proposed SVG spec. I mean, it was a one-for-one -one mapping uh, to PDF 1.1, uh, page descriptions, Microsoft got in there and kind of tweet, tweeted it around a little bit, and so as, as any standards effort, what came out isn't exactly what went in, uh, but pretty close. Um, and so we did inject a little bit of, of PDF goodness, you might say, into the web. And finally, many, many decades, years, almost decades later, every web browser has SVG support, and it's now hardware optimized, which is a key thing. Uh, so in some cases, SVG is now faster than PDF because of the hardware optimization. Um, which is interesting, but it almost died. SVG had a near-death experience, in part because Adobe said, wait a minute, we're making all our money here. Why the heck do we want to do this thing? And, uh, and kind of put the brakes on. So was there a question in the back? Yeah, I was just wondering, when you said you declined the offer to fully integrate, what, what would that look like? What, what did you mean by full integration? Well, let's just say Adobe was a major stockholder in Netscape Corporation prior to its IPO. In fact, most of Adobe's subsequent venture capital investing was generated, was funded by the profits from that IPO. And there were various business discussions about between Adobe and Netscape that I don't know how many skeletons I want to rip out of the closet just yet, but, but uh, come talk to me over a beer after and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you more. Um, okay, but now after we had, SVG had this near-death experience, we had second thoughts because there was this thing called XPS coming. 
from Microsoft as part of this awesome new operating system for Microsoft that what became Vista. And we were really scared. Uh, I was back at Adobe. I'd left and done a startup and I'd come back. And we started working on various things, but, but one of them was, well, XPS is turning PD, a PDF-like thing into an, into an XML-based thing. And then it puts it in a zip package, which is a little bit more modular and modern. But we could do that with PDF and use SVG and kind of still keep some ownership, you know, not like have Microsoft take over with this XPS thing. And so we did this thing called Project Mars that, that was a way to take PDF and make an isomorphic XML version of it that could be put in a zip file and, and uh, um, Bob's your uncle. And it turns out the page contents, uh, the SVG and all the other stuff, um, that was put in a OC, something called open container format packaging that was shared with what became EPUB. So EPUB, which was coming along at the same time, actually had taken the submission from Adobe of this packaging standard in, in kind of a competitive bake-off of what should be the packaging format. That packaging format was also the format of this thing called Air Apps that you might remember. So we had Air Apps, EPUB, and this new kind of PDF-like thing all sharing a common package, which, which is kind of, again, another piece of ancient, uh, ancient history here. But in 2009, uh, Adobe, we said, nah, never mind. We learned that, yep, we can represent PDF page contents in SVG. That was actually some interesting good work, some hard work to really figure it out because SVG had been languished, languishing so long, no one was any sure anymore that as PDF had evolved, could we still do PDF in SVG? Did the transparency models mesh? Did the, did the shading models mesh and all that kind of stuff? And that, some good technical work was done to figure that out and, and in, in fact create some extensions to SVG. But it really didn't move the needle. The, the XML serialization of binary PDF didn't expand the usefulness of the PDF platform. So okay, now you've got XML in a zip file instead of a binary thing that's kind of a little cumbersome, but there's a lot of tools to manipulate that binary PDF. It's not, you can't just unzip it with consumer stuff that you've already got installed in your operating system, but it's, it's prevalent, it's ubiquitous. And Vista was flopping, so XPS was not a threat. So uh, you know, big companies often work best when they're under threat, uh, or I should say innovate most when they're under threat. Because you, know, you can't just keep turning the crank on the cash cow, and, and uh, it looked like innovation was no longer quite so necessary. So Adobe backed away from Mars, and in some ways backed away from work it had started in parallel uh, on, on, on e-books, on, on a next generation of digital publishing, this thing called uh, EPUB. So one of, my, one of my Adobe skeletons in the closet I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, pull out now is that there were three names, there were two other names along the way to what became EPUB. The first name was an internal name at Adobe. We were the ones who took this original format called OEB, or Open eBook Format, or OEB Publication Format, that, that this group called the IDPF, originally the Open eBook Forum, had developed. Microsoft actually did most of the work on it, which was interesting. So this, this whole using XHTML and CSS thing that was, that was EPUB, Microsoft was one of the instigators, but they abandoned it. They abandoned, and one of the reasons they did it was that it could, content could reflow and it was more dynamic and adaptive than, than PDF. Uh, that, they didn't like PDF much in, in those days either. Uh, but we, we, we took that work and revived it, mo had the idea of modernizing it with more interesting modern web standards, including SVG, but still retaining this logical, structure-centric view. And we were thinking about it as the next generation of PDF. So PDF2 was, an, was one of the code names uh, that, that, was, that was used to refer to what became EPUB. Uh, another was Metro, but then Microsoft took that to mean the packaging format of, of, uh, of, of XAML and, and, and XPS, so we had to abandon that. Um, then when IDPF got involved and worked, we were working to make it an open standard, they wanted to call it, or, or the, the group in, my, in, in IDPF wanted to call it dot .book. But Adobe had this thing called FrameMaker. And at that point, it was kind of languishing also. But, but the Frame guys called their file format dot .book. And, and I knew those guys were going to kill me. And they were just going to kill me if, I could, if, I, if, if at IDPF, where I think I was serving on the board, we called it dot .book. So we had to come up with another, another name. And, and, and so EPUB was born uh, to, to basically placate uh, Frame. <laughs> So, but I think it's a better name because dot book would have been too narrow a name for all the purposes EPUB is now being being put to, which was a consideration. But I, I think dot book would have won the day if it wasn't for um, the frame guys being pretty unhappy. So EPUB is 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 pretty simple. It's a zip based archive. Uh, we we adapted that from Open Document ODF format. So the Open Document format actually had a pretty modular packaging. It still does have modular packaging, and we said, well, you know, that has nothing to do with being an Office document format. It's just a modular packaging technology 
that zip plus an XML manifest. Let's, uh, let's grab that, add stuff so that if you need security and encryption, you, if you, you know, the hooks to put in DRAM, let's make sure that works there. And then, and then we'll stick in this OEB stuff, which already had a, a document level um, XML schema called OPF. And so OPF, that OPF thing there, uh, is, is really what makes this an EPUB. All the rest is just web stuff, it's HTML, CSS, JPEG, etc. So really the stuff in bold there is, is, is the only thing that's zip file that makes, technically makes EPUB uh, an EPUB. And, and all was good. And of course, eBooks started happening. And even though Amazon didn't natively support EPUB, all the publishers decided, you know, we're not going to give Amazon this, their proprietary format. We don't, we don't want to be locked into their jail. So let's use EPUB. And, and at this point, all of the top 10 publishers in the US uh, are giving Amazon EPUB files, now EPUB 3 files, um, not Mobi files. A Amazon attempted to upgrade Mobi to an HTML5 base as we did with EPUB, but they basically gave up on that in terms of getting publishers to directly do it. Although now there is a web browser under the cover in, in, in modern Kindles. Um, so, so EPUB kind of won as the general ebook interchange format for the publishers to use to distribute content. and it one as the distribution format to consumers, except for Amazon, who is, who is converting it to their own thing. Of course, there's a lot of cloud-based EPUB solutions and other solutions that transform EPUB into other things, so that's perfectly, uh, perfectly cool. And, and those devices have evolved. I mean, there's much slicker devices now than there were in 2007 where the Kindle launched. But we realized at IDPF some years ago, back, back in 2010, 2011, that, that this wasn't the future of reading digitally. This was sort of a carry-on of the past of reading digitally. And sure, compared to uh, reading a PDF file, it was nice that EPUB could, you could press a button and the text would reflow. But that was, that was just one kind of small piece of, of what it really meant to be uh, a digital reading experience. When you started having all kinds of tablets, smartphones, hybrids, and so on. Um, and so EPUB 3 was designed to, to kind of go past that well, we're doing novels and simple linear fiction. We're trying to do all the range of content uh, and do it in a way that enables taking, taking advantage of all the affordances of, of digital devices. And really with the, the smartphone being, being the center of, of what was going to be coming. Um, we, we didn't know, actually, that the tablet wouldn't take over the world and smartphones would fall away. But we had a hypothesis that that, that wouldn't happen. Because if we did think it was going to be big screen tablets, of course, PDF could have just all stuck with fixed format PDF or at least to some degree. But the, 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 the number of small screens pro proliferating really made that much more, much more problematic. And so we embarked on EPUB 3, adding styling and layout improvements for the reflow content, for the first time supporting an EPUB fixed layout content, adding interactivity and rich media, global language support so you could do all the world's uh, topography, um, and uh, comprehensive accessibility support. And we decided to do that uh, by, by significantly improving the web standards alignment. Uh, EPUB 2 had been based on an old version of XHTML 1.1, uh, a subset of that, and a subset of CSS2, and the world had moved on. But in 2011, it was a bit early and, I won't say bold, but a bit controversial that we ended up going with HTML5. We ended up fully adopting HTML5 and essentially rebasing EPUB on the HTML5 foundation. I won't say it was too early, but it, 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 it did extend the migration from EPUB 2 to EPUB 3. The vast majority of EPUB 2 reading systems were, were using software written in this building by Adobe uh, that was a custom formatter. You know, it did CSS formatting of HTML and SVG, but, but not based on a browser engine, based on a custom engine, which therefore couldn't do JavaScript, couldn't do a bunch of the other things that, that, uh, that a browser can do. So we decided that the open web platform was the way to go. That that the that the EPUB's strength was separation of content and presentation, and that as we moved to support interactivity, moved to support rich media, we wanted to do that uh, aligned with the web, rather than going down the path of a custom XML format. And we we were informed on this by uh, one of our key partners, the Daisy Consortium. The Daisy Consortium is the leading group working on accessible digital books and other technology for the blind and other print disabled uh, individuals. And they do braille generation, talking book generation, books that have, that have pre-recorded audio, uh, et cetera. And they had developed a format called DAISY DT Book for digital talking book that became a standard. It's actually mandated for K through 12 textbooks in the United States, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, that there's something called the NIMAS, the Nux National 
instructional materials accessibility standard that specifies DAISY DTBOOK must be provided for every K-12 textbook uh, in use. Uh, that is painfully, reluctantly, and, and sometimes not respected by the publishers who find it a big pain in the ass to, pardon my French, to develop this custom format. And the DAISY guys knew it. So by 2010, they realized, you know what, we're, we're failing to, to stop the end the drought of accessible digital text by mandates when those mandates specify something that's too expensive for the publisher to do. We need to take accessibility and graft it on to the mainstream format. They decided, I hate to say it, PDF was a lost cause, uh, and they went with EPUB and said, let's, let's work to help EPUB go mainstream uh, with all the accessibility we need so that instead of asking publishers to create this DT book thing, uh, which they won't do or won't do well, uh, and we'll, we'll just get it at, sort of off the shelf when they do commercial digital books. They also helped us realize the benefits of being part of a bigger platform. The same reason that caused them to not want to be a specialized accessibility format caused the IDPF to not want EPUB to be a specialized ebook format or a custom XML format, but really be just portable documents for the web. They grafted themselves onto a broader platform, and we've ever since been busy grafting ourselves on the even broader platform of the web. So we have now in, in EPUB 3 a superset of all the features that were in DAISY DT book that really make EPUB 3 a accessible by design format. Um, not every EPUB file will have all these features, but every EPUB file has reliable navigation. That's a, that's a baseline of what makes an EPUB an EPUB um, and a defined reading order. Of course, PDF has a defined reading order too, but that defined reading order is page by page and may not map to any logical structure. EPUB imposes a requirement for logical structure and some requirements if you do have fixed layout for what to do. Of course, if you have a sequence of comic pictures, you may not deliver accessibility based on the nature of the information. But the idea of EPUB is that, is that you deliver the maximum accessibility based on the nature of the information. I won't, I won't talk about all those things, although I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that come up. Um, so, you know, this thing called Flash was busy being replaced by HTML5 around the same time. And so I think it's a fair question to say, well, do we really need portable documents anymore? I mean, if the whole world's going web, if things like Flash that were arguably more successful than EPUB or perhaps PDF are, are, are so rapidly displaced by the web, why do we even need uh, portable documents anymore? And I think there are some good reasons. Of course, you guys all know that high quality presentation and, and printability is important. Um, it's still the case that websites aren't reliably archivable or offline usable. You know, things like the Wayback Machine, even things like Google indexing, don't necessarily capture um, all the semantics of these dynamic websites because they depend on server backends. If your PHP server is the one <coughs> dynamically generating customized <coughs> HTML pages on the fly, you're never going to get um, offline usable content unless you can find a way to take their PHP server offline, uh, which you can't do. Um, and, and portable documents allow content to be redistributed and monetized through indirect means. You, you can have content syndication, and that's the way the vast majority of EPUB content is deployed. You can find EPUB files on the web, just like you can find PDFs. There's a lot more PDFs out there, orders of magnitude more. Many more PDF EPUB files are turned into websites because it's already basically a website and a package. So there's lots of folks like uh, Wiley, for example, John Wiley, major publisher. They distribute PDF EPUBs of their eBooks but for their journal articles, they use EPUB internally as an enterprise workflow technology between their content production and their web team. But the web team is just deploying HTML5. So their EPUB is a transport layer internally to their workflow, but what goes out is, is web. Uh, but it's also important that when you want to, that content can be syndicated and used offline. Of course, uh, portable documents can be easier to author than, uh, than, than, than uh, hand-coded, especially websites. And, and uh, I think we saw that with the, with the uh, we, we probably don't remember anymore, but the, the Obamacare site, um, you, know, they, you know, a website is a complicated beast um, when you're connecting databases and all kinds of stuff. Um, a portable document can be simple, can be, it's sort of, it's pre-baked. In the case of EPUB, it's not pre-typeset necessarily, but it's definitely still pre-baked. Um, and then again, the deterministic structural semantics. From, from the EPUB point of view, the web doesn't, P EPUB sits in the middle between a PDF world that's reliable in terms of visual presentation, but unreliable in terms of semantics and accessibility, 
and between that and the web, which is unreliable in, in essentially in both. You know, the web doesn't give you reliable structural semantics, and our, our, our mission essentially, essentially is to add that to the web. So the website is like this, this you know, dynamic random chamber, and we want to be able to overlay that in the case of a given publication with something reliable, a reliable um, seal, to take a word from our keynote speaker, over that publication, wh which can include actually a digital mm -hmm. signature, but it's more, it's more the structure and accessibility and, and so on. And we also bring some order for publishers to this plethora of web standards. The open web platform is, is hundreds, or over 100 anyway, different specs. And so we define a minimum profile of those specs that can be de depended on by a publisher. So essentially, EPUB just makes web content into reliable publications. So you know, they can reflow, but still look pretty. We can have fixed layout. These are all commercial ebooks I'm showing you here. Um, in the case of Japanese or, or other uh, multilingual content, it can have the typographic rules respected, uh, writing direction, but also things like Ruby and other um, punctuation rules, Tate Chuyoko, it's called in Japanese, um, can all be uh, respected in, in the EPUB because it's not uh, typeset at the factory. And we can have content that is, that is cloud distributed. So EPUB is, is, works well with cloud distribution. Of course, it's possible to distribu distribute PDF files over the cloud uh, for online consumption in a, in a directly in a browser. But you end up resorting to either bitmap images of pages, which are not very um, easy to work with and, and view, um, or you, you end up with something like the PDF.js uh, 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 work of Mozilla Labs, which is you know 10 megabytes of JavaScript code to turn PDF into something that can render in a browser. Because EPUB starts out as HTML, CSS already, it's a lot thinner for us to render it in the browser than it is for full, uh, for full PDF. So we've gotten some good support for EPUB 3 now, um, um, including Adobe, who's Adobe's digital editions app, and its RMS DK is, is upgraded to EPUB 3, um, Apple, Google, et cetera. Um, there's a lot more authoring tool options now. Adobe InDesign generates both fixed and reflow EPUB, uh, and we have many other things. Apple iBooks Author is an example of a, of a major tool that launched before EPUB 3 really had taken off in, in, in early 2012, um, but has now added EPUB export support and EPUB template support. And their last update release, every, everything they added was a fix or a feature around EPUB. So, so um, we, we're, we're very happy that, that, that the adoption is, is growing worldwide. Japan is, is a stronghold for EPUB because EPUB 2 really never was used there uh, because it didn't support uh, kanji, their, their writing system. They basically started with EPUB 3 and decided to adopt it for manga uh, as well. So they could have used uh, PDF or something else for eManga, but they decided to use Fixlayout EPUB 3, and that's done a lot for adoption of that uh, format. And now we've got an initiative going with the global education publishers around uh, EPUB 3 for e-textbooks. That's called the EduPub Alliance, and I don't have time to uh, go into all the details, but there's a link there, um, and it's, it's uh, going along quite well uh, with, with partners involved. Uh, from an authoring point of view, the, the, this is different. a key difference of, of of EPUB from PDF. PDF being kind of a print stream format at its architectural roots, you can say that if you can represent something as a sequen sequence of pages, you're pretty much done with being able to create a base PDF. If you want to make a good EPUB, you don't want to start that way. You can do that way since we support fixed layout, but you don't get anything that's better than PDF. You need to start with something that can generate structural information, but that that's a little bit more interesting to do depending on what your authoring tool situation is. If you've got an XML first environment, if you've got InDesign, which operates in a structured way, if you use it right, um, and, and not if you don't, um, then, then you can do that. Um, but if you've got a random desktop app, um, and all you've got is a print button, um, then there's interesting issues in creating EPUB, which I think some folks in this ecosystem might be able to help address and maybe make some money on, as more and more people want EPUB content. Um, techniques you guys have learned to add structure to PDF and to make better PDFs, um, I think, are very applicable. Um, so people are, are taking XML first information and, and basically generating PDFs and XML and EPUB you know, side by side. That's Hachette Lieb, one of the top publishers in the world, how they, make, um, how they make PDFs in one of their workflows. And they decide uh, when they want to take their backlist and kind of do XML conversion of their backlist. Again, another interesting heuristic uh, challenge. Uh, but then that lets them get back into that XML workflow from, from PDF backlist. 
but for fixed layout stuff, they can go straight from InDesign and make these beautiful books. Uh, and they don't necessarily go through all those things, but they're not trying to make a uh, flexible PDF, EPUB. They're trying to make an EPUB equivalent of a PDF. Um, and they can even do that with PDF as well. Since SVG is the equivalent, they've got another workflow that, tur that turns PDF into EPUB through SVG. So they've got like five different ways to make EPUB depending on their content. And the point of all that is that it's, it's complicated and flexible, but technology can be, um, can, be, can be helped. They even have a bitmap uh, way to do it too. So you know, this is somebody else's slides about taking unstructured PDF that doesn't encode all these structural things and doing reconstruction of that structure. It's not a fully solved problem. I think there's people in this ecosystem of PDF that can help bring this problem to bear um, into this broader picture, and I hope some of you will help. Because I think the future of publishing is not just digitized print. Digitized print's not going away. E-paper's not going away. But increasingly, it's going to be native digital content. People are going to want content for these devices that takes advantage of what those devices can give you that works whatever the size of the device is and is accessible to people whether, regardless of their print disabilities. And that me means authoring content natively, and that's going to require a different, a different approach. So um, Elsevier is an example of, a, of someone who's already totally revised their way of thinking about design of content to designing modules of information, not like Hachette in a production. They don't think of themselves as in a production pipeline. They think of themselves as in a knowledge and learning and curriculum uh, development pipeline um, and using EPUB as an organizing principle for how they manage these, these modules of content, dynamically remixing and, and making them available. It's more like software product management in, in the way they're thinking about creating publications now. Um, and that's well supported by this platform. We've got an open source foundation uh, that's backing up the EPUB spec work with open source that's, uh, that's freely available um, with projects for, for native app rendering. That's part of what's used by Adobe's new offering, cloud-based rendering, and, a, and a, a lightweight DRM system in, in development. Uh, we've got a conformance test suite that's kind of interesting. You can see how EPUB reading systems uh, match up to each other in features. There's the kind of a can I use uh, for EPUB that's part of this. We've got a collaboration going with the W3C. So if anyone's involved in the W3C, I strongly encourage you to get involved in the Digital Publishing Interest Group, which is meeting this, this week in Sapporo. Thank you, thank you, uh, Duff, for saving me a trip to Sapporo. Um, not that that would be a bad place, but, but I'd, I'm happier to, be, to have a shorter trip from Seattle to here. Um, we've got many other collaborations going on. Uh, South Korea, we have major activity with the Government Education Ministry and the Copyright Commission of the, of the um, Industry, Ministry of Industry. Uh, <coughs> EPUB has been adopted as a Korean national standard, and it's already become, through their submission, an ISO level TS, or technical specification. And we have a joint working group, and, and IDPF has been invited to be a direct pass submitter to JTC1 of ISO, and we expect that the next release of EPUB will become a full IS. We've just launched last month with, with uh, the f government of France, two different ministries of the French culture are sponsoring uh, uh, IDPF and Redium Europe office in Paris uh, that will cover the whole European uh, ecosystem. And we formed this new European Digital Reading Lab, EDR Lab, um, um, and are pushing on that. So I think, from my point of view, this open interoperable standards for EPUB and web technologies for publishing, in some sense, is something we can all take advantage of. It's not about PDF uh, or EPUB. It's about what's this bigger future of, of portable documents. So I'm going to skip some of the stuff here so we can go on to questions. I just kind of conclude by saying that I think of PDF and EPUB as not competing things, duking it out uh, for love and attention and adoption, but as complementary serializations of, of a portable document in, 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 in a lowercase p, lowercase d sense. And in some cases, PDFs can be preferable. If you're making something for prepress, it's going to be a long time until uh, EPUB is the, 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 the primary solution there, if ever. We did just have the first EPUB print-on-demand solution launched in July, uh, but that's the first one. You've got 500 of them in the PDF ecosystem. But in some cases, EPUB is going to be a preferable serialization. It's, it's going to be a, if you, if you need to get past the page, if the page is not the primary unit of information, uh, PDF is just not the optimum bedlo bedrock for that, for that uh, content. And uh, EPUB can support all the richness of PDF uh, plus more. And in some cases, it may not matter. If you've got fixed layout content, you may flip a coin of whether you want to use a fixed layout EPUB or PDF, and that's fine. And it may depend what you're going to do with it later. If it's going to go out through some web pipeline, maybe fixed layout EPUB is going to be better. 
Um, but if it's going to go to print, maybe maybe PDF's better. My view is that a bigger portable document platform that's natively part of the web is going to make this a bigger e ecosystem for all of us. So uh, it's not just about um, which format wins. It's about portable documents having an enduring role uh, in this web ecosystem. So we can squabble about should you use PDF or EPUB and what's, what's the accessible mandates and all that stuff. I'd rather just worry about how to make content accessible for everybody and, uh, and not, not consider that there's this strong line. Maybe part of that's my own bias. Remember, the first name of EPUB was PDF2. So my, I have a big tent uh, view on it. So there's some links. Um, if you think this is all a bunch of nonsense, uh, t tweet me at, at Bill McCoy and say so. Uh, and uh, I think we have just a couple minutes for some questions. So. And these slides will be posted, I'm sure, please. Um, if you had to take a wild guess, how long would you take um, it to be the, the time when uh, the PDF basis around this moves over to EPUB? Well, moves over is a funny word. I mean, that's like saying, when is the dot .doc basis going to move to dot .docx? If you think, if I think, without disrespect intended, I think of a PDF file as a older serialization of a kind of a fixed layout EPUB. Someday, we might all use this EPUB serialization, but we may not. We may say, that, no, the PDF serialization has enduring value, and we're never going to move. So I don't think it's important, even when that happens. I do think that, that there are going to be um, mandates for governments, entities, agencies that cannot be satisfied with, with PDF. In fact, I know that there are. edX signed a consent decree with the Department of Justice last year, uh, which is a consortium <coughs> of 50 universities from Harvard on down, that basically said, OK, among other things, we're going to not use PDF. We're going to use EPUB 3. The Italian government passed a law that said, Actually, it was a decree of the education ministry, but I think in Japan, law and decree are kind of the same. I mean, Italy, law and decree are the same thing. That basically said, you've got to use e-textbook formats that reflow. It was basically saying you've got to use EPUB or something like it, not, not PDF. So I think we're going to have mandates for logical structured content from accessibility. There's a refresh of the 508 uh, 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 compliance coming. Now, you guys can and should do as much as you can to add more and more accessibility to PDF, and I think it's all great. But as long as only 1% of PDF files in the wild exhibit those things, and 99% don't, um, that it's not going to matter. People, people in the accessibility community will think PDF is not a very good accessibility format. And maybe together we can somehow market this better, but uh, generally speaking, a reflowable EPUB is going to be pretty good accessible. Even a fixed layout EPUB that's done with CSS is likely to be more accessible than PDF based on the way PDF does its uh, you know, character by character, character um, geometry. So um, I don't think, I'm not going to claim EPUB is better than PDF from an accessibility point of view, although it does have some features. PDF doesn't, like, like media overlays. As far as I know, there's no way to synchronize pre-recorded audio with text rendering uh, in PDF. So there are some important features that EPUB does have, but I think it's fundamentally about just getting past that page-centric orientation when that's not, rel that's not critical to the type of content. Yeah, that makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm not making any bold predictions. No, no. <laughs> that was your question there. Uh, so um, like, I, I, if the main value proposition for EPUB is like accessibility and reflow, uh, I'm wondering if, like, the latest developments, like in deep learning, uh, mm -hmm. that may apply to, let's say, PDF, so an automated kind of understanding of, of document that computers may remove the kind of the main benefit of EPUB? Correct. So, so well, one, way, one way to say it is this. Accessibility is a mine canary, if you know that term, uh, for a document that can be easily machine processed and semantically understood in a reliable way. But a PDF or, a, frankly, OC, a scanned images, a sequence of scanned images, you can, you can OCR them, you can analyze them, and you can give a machine some ability to understand it. But the machine might be confused about what's the call. Is this a column gap or just some white space? Yes, might be confused as well. Exactly. So, so EPUB imposes a structure that makes it more reliable. I, I sometimes tell people that EPUB is more about how machines can talk to other machines with content and less about how machines can talk to people with content. But that gets them all freaked out. Um, but but I, don't, I don't think that giving machines fuzzy content and expecting them to do the hard work of semantic, turning into semantically reliable information will be the, the, the best way to do it. I think the best way, if you're starting from structured information in the first place, is to leave it structured in your distribution format, which is what EPUB enables you to do, and what the web tried to do but kind of got sidetracked into uh, JavaScript spaghetti. Um, so uh, you might say that we picked up the, we picked up the um, torch for the semantic semantic web uh, that the W3C dropped when it went chasing after Flash.
So it's not just semantic web, but it's, it, it, it is part of that. But, but, uh, and, and engaging with that learning community is, is a big part of what we're, what we're working on doing. So. Okay, one more question. Uh, so you mentioned uh, in the early days of SVG, you could take a PDF and map it to an SVG file with a sort of one-to-one -one lossless mapping. Well, somewhere in the mid-days, but okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, how does that work with, with EPUB? Because it seems to me that you can't really go from a PDF to an SVG with, without losing some fidelity, especially with regards to some of the fonts. Well, yeah, that's why I'm not in that room. You know, I, I, I'm glad to have this, this, this room, because as we used to say back in the old days, fonts are hell, you know, and, and, and it, uh, you know, the fly in all these ornaments is fonts. But, but, of course, there's three ways to represent fixed layout content. Well, there's several ways. There's at least three ways to represent fixed layout content in EPUB. CSS absolute positioning, which cannot visually map exactly to an SV, to a e PDF because the imaging model is too primitive and weird. Um, and you can use bitmap images, which map precisely, but is used the scalability. Or you can do SVG, which has just a few corner cases, like fonts and a few other things. But I don't know if, I don't think Matthew Hardy is in this room. But I mean, there's some smart people who've worked, like Matthew Hardy, you can talk to, who who've done PhD theses on these problems. And I think in Project Mars, Adobe solved a lot of the issues. And people are using it. Hachette is making SVG-based fixed layout from PDFs and distributing them on the iBook Store and other EPUB 3 distribution channels. So it is working for them. That doesn't mean it's, it's sort of uh, theoretically lossless, but it is working. And when it doesn't work, they can, they can back off and generate bitmaps of pages and so on. So, so from a practical point of view, I think it, it, is, it is increasingly plausible. I mean, there's a, Airbook is a, a, a vendor here in San Francisco, AER book. They've got a website you can upload a PDF and, and it gives you back an EPUB. Fixed layout EPUB that I think is bitmap images of pages, but you know, it's, th these are getting better. But there's a lot more opportunity. If someone was to make a beautiful solution for turning um, PDF into reflowable EPUB, mm -hmm. the world would beat a path to your doorstep uh, because it's in demand from, from some very big players. And some, some major players have made investments there. IBM is one example, uh, Intel is another who are making significant investments in the EPUB open source and EPUB ecosystem because they see these accessibility mandates coming. IBM has just said straight out, we don't think we can keep distributing PDF because we think that the governments that we sell to are going to demand a, an accessible format. And so we got to help make this work. And again, if you've got something to, some solutions, some technology, some IP to bring to bear, I think it can be welcomed, I hope. All right, well, well, I thank everybody, and if you have more questions, I will be around for this next uh, two days and, uh, and uh, bend my ear. And uh, if you're interested in getting involved, of course, consider uh, joining the uh, IDPF or uh, forking our Redium code and, and getting involved in that and, 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 and so on. So thanks very much.